Have worked. you always been a very like self-deprecating person? Yes. Mm. Is that a defense mechanism or you just think it's funny? Both. Let's go. Keeps is an online subscription service which makes it easy and more affordable for men to treat their male pattern baldness from the comfort of their home. So about two out of three guys will experience male pattern baldness before the age of 35. And I unfortunately was one of those. As much as I tried to deny it, my hairline started to recede whenever I was in high school. And in hindsight, I kind of wish I was more proactive about it, but I'm still able to hang on to the hair that I do have and then some, because that's where Keeps comes in. There are currently only two FDA approved hair loss treatments and Keeps combines both of them in a two-in-one gel. Their treatments are clinically proven to work, being 90% effective at stopping hair loss and increasing growth by up to 35%, with most men noticing results within the first six months. In the past six years, they've already helped over a million men with thousands of five-star reviews. And in addition to their treatments, they also have other products like shampoos, conditioners, and styling pomades. But the best part is that it's super convenient and affordable. There's no need to go to medical providers or pay for expensive prescriptions. Just affordable, expert-level hair care delivered to your door in discreet, non-branded packaging. And they work with your schedule, with flexibility options for 3 to 6 to 12-month delivery options. And you can adjust, pause, or cancel your plan at any time. You just take their quick online consultation plan, and they craft a treatment plan tailor-made for your needs. So whether you're trying to stop hair loss, stimulate growth, or just maintain your hair, Keeps has you covered. Thank you to Keeps for sponsoring this episode and for the free product. Hair loss stops with Keeps. For a special offer to get started, go to keeps.com slash mattymorphosis or click the link in the description. That's K-E-E-P-S dot com slash M-A-D-D-Y-M-O-R-P-H-O-S-I-S. Again, keeps.com slash mattymorphosis. And now, on to the video. Hi guys, welcome back to Give It To Me Straight, where we have such big questions for such a tiny little show. Joining me on the show today is renowned actor, contestant on season 13 of RuPaul's Drag Race, and the Kelly of Stephanie's Child, the one and only <laughs> Rosé. <laughs> Work. Work. Hi, everyone. What's going on? Welcome. Welcome to Vegas. Thank you so much. Bitch, I've been here. I was about to say, well, I was saying welcome <clears throat> to Vegas, but it's actually like week th it's your week, farewell. Uh, week three. Yeah, and you're about to leave, so this is your... I am about to leave. It's my farewell, yeah. Your last hurrah. My farewell tour is begins today, and it starts in this room, so... Mm -hmm. It's, it's like the, the top of the roller coaster whenever it like goes oh, to, for sure. right before it shoots down. Yeah, yeah. This is the peak for a lot of people. So, yeah. I mean, I, I like to, you know, not to give myself too many flowers, but, you know, this is a, this is a big deal for many people. It's I mean, a big for, deal not, for me. Not, no, I mean, you are a finalist, but, you know, for some of the other queens, though. LOL. No, this is, your podcast is fucking lit. You've had so many. I've been, I've been doing my homework. I've been watching it. I, I watched, um... I identify with what Alaska said. Alaska said, I've been, I've been watching. Mm -hmm. And then just started watching. Like, you know, doing your homework, just seeing what I'm what I'm going to be doing. And then I'm like, oh my God, this is so good. Your show is so good. Thank you. I love it. And it, your guests are, are great. It's, you've, got, you've had so many. Yeah, for the most part. But like, it, it, makes, <laughs> it, makes, me, it makes me nervous whenever a guest tells me, they're like, oh yeah, I watched the show, I know it. Because normally, it's, it's a, sometimes it's more fun when the guest doesn't know. They're just like, oh, another interview, yeah, let's do I would it. never do that, though. Yeah. I'm me. I would never, ever not. I no. would not come here. You're, you're too professional. I just, to I, a fault. I must be somewhat prepared. Yeah. If I can be. Hopefully it's not to my detriment, but if it is, we'll just edit it out. So we... <laughs> right, you have the power. So. Yeah. <laughs> I learned that from Drag Race. Yeah, it's you your show. Exactly. It's yeah, your yeah, show. Yeah. <laughs> I don't blame it on the edit. Yeah. I weaponize the edit. I am the edit. <laughs> I, I am the edit. I am, like, I'm the one who knocks, but I'm the one who edits. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, you're, you're just finishing up your run at Drag Race Live right now. And yes. you actually have, you actually have the only number I know of where someone actually sings live in the show. I am the first person um, to, the first uh cast member to sing in the show mm -hmm. would you say that's like your favorite thing about drag is being able to sing live for for people yeah. no my favorite part of drag is getting out of drag like let's oh. be fucking serious <laughs> um but i do love singing in drag and mm. i think it's 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 silly of me at this point to not try and implement some sort of singing into mm -hmm you know, numbers that I do in shows like that, where it's basically like a talent show. Because it's A, really good to diversify the show. Mm -hmm. It makes me stand apart. And people like come expecting to see, well, to see this, which they're not getting anymore, but. Um, no, because you look so good. <laughs> this is such a good retelling. Like, Thank I love you. It. it was, it, I think this is about as accurate as I could get. I don't know where she got that hideous dress or fabric or whatever she got that Did you from, keep but... some makeup brushes aside where you were like, I'm just not gonna wash these for a couple of years in case Rose wants to come on the show? I, like... I let them like age like hams in a freezer, you know? Uh -huh. they, they, you know, the longer they sit there, the more. For sure. Yeah. <laughs> the, the the freezing marinade. It's like aging like fine wine, except it's like milk. Okay. You know? It's like light curdling. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 
But like whenever you go to a drag show, you're singing live. Obviously, audience members don't expect that to at a traditional drag show. Would you say sure. that you leave the audience captivated or captive to your singing? Both. Both? Yeah. I mean, some people do expect it and are like dying for it and are like so happy that it happens when it happens. And some people are genuinely are gagged and like are mm. like, oh shit, is you know, is is that is she singing? And mm. then I start to sing kind of flat and they're like, oh yeah, she's definitely singing. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> well, I, I will say that like, you're singing though, like unlike a lot of queens, because I mean, I've seen queens sing live before, but most of the time, like nine out of ten, they're not good singers. Yeah. You know? No, so it's, for sure. <laughs> it, it's very like I will say that is like probably the surprise where she sings and you have the microphone and there's like Oh wait, that that was a well, no. That was a no. I do it. It's because it, I am good at it. Um, yeah. There's so much singing in drag, and there's a lot of good singing in drag, but there's mostly terrible singing in drag. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm proud to present um, a, a, a a good standard of singing in drag most of the time. Mm -hmm. You know, we all have our off days. <laughs> yeah, you know, <laughs> you're having one right now, sweetie. I'm so sorry. Off. I'm having. This is an on day. This is. <laughs> This is high art. This you're, is high camp. You're, you're bottom safe. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this is lightly burnt. You're crispy, honey. Yeah. Those eyes are crispy. <laughs> oh, my God. Then I did my job. Um, but with, a, like, like, with singing, like, it's, as far as like drag, it's, it used to be a lot more common. And it is common in like, other countries. Do you feel like it's kind of like died as like a drag art form? Or do you think it's just drag has just kind of shifted? No, I don't think so at all. I think it still exists all over the place. I think that um, yeah, drag being, you know... Performed at the at the level that it is now. Moreover, you have to convince you know promoters and directors and producers that you are good enough to actually carry and sing live because it's it's not just mm -hmm. something that people just want to throw on stage if it's not good from a directing standpoint. Um, but I mean, if anything, I would say that lip sync has has even taken over more so because like you know I, I correct me if I'm wrong in the comments, but I'd like in the UK. Most of the queens, like singing live, was like what you would do mm -hmm. until like oh, there was only a couple of queens, a couple of shows where you would go in in like England, um, and and see uh, performers lip syncing. It wasn't mm -hmm. it wasn't like very common. And now with Drag Race UK, of course, they have to lip sync um, to make the competition work, to make the the you know mm -hmm. the the blueprint of Drag Race work. And it's it's you know now that that art form is prevalent in the UK as well. Mm -hmm. I don't know, I, I think singing is still around. It's just, you know, do, do people do it or do they not do it? Yeah. I always try and do it a little bit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, we went to uh, Germany once and we saw drag shows, one on East Berlin, one in West Berlin, and yeah. they have like that cultural divide in Germany. And East Berlin, it was standard lip syncing, you know, dancing, very like westernized. But then West Berlin, it was still like the old school, like drag, everyone singing live. It's yeah. not about the crazy makeup. It's, it, they're barely even wearing any makeup. And it's just very interesting, the cultural differences. Sure. Yeah. Well, if anything, I'm here to fuse both of those together. Mm. Both crazy you're, you're makeup. The, you're the bridge between worlds. And live singing, yes. Yeah, the glue that holds it all together. <laughs> I'm middle Berlin. <laughs> middle I, Berlin. I wish you're I lived wall. in Berlin. I honestly wish I lived in Berlin. I think I would do so well there. I love Berlin so much. When I'm on Work the World, like I've I've been like scouting to see where I could live in in my life. I could live in Berlin. I th I really think I might move to Spain one day. Spain. I love Spain to Madrid. Spain. Spain is just my favorite country. Oh, sure. I don't know why. I love it so much. It's so beautiful. It's rich in culture. It's gorgeous. The weather is stunning. Um, it it's great. Hmm. But as I mentioned, you're a member of Stephanie's Child, which is like a little singing group with other drag queens. But for those who don't know what that is, can you explain who Stephanie's Child is? Stephanie's Child is the girl group um, comprised of myself, Jan Sport, and Laguna Blue. And we started, when I started drag, is um, I started and then right after we got together and started mm -hmm. Stephanie's Child. And we we bonded together and were this really great team um, for a few years before Drag Race started taking us, you know, one by one and um, separating us. And now we're kind of all doing our own thing for the time being. But mm -hmm. it was this really wonderful, little era before the pandemic where where like there was like this real actually good really good musical vocal act in mm -hmm. drag it was really exciting it shook the the industry a little bit and I mean, we were like, we were getting TV spots left and right, like pretty quickly. Yeah, you, you, were, know. you were on uh, America's Got Talent and The Voice. Yeah, The Voice. We, the Voice happened six months after I started doing drag. Oh, it's, wow. it's a gag to me. The, yeah, my first year in drag because of Stephanie's Child mm -hmm. was, a, was a complete gag. Um, just because we had so many really ridiculous, unheard of opportunities. Mm -hmm. um, it was a really exciting time. And I really, I really miss making music with them because it's mm -hmm. like, there's just nothing else like it.
It's well, so good. With, with getting on like America's Got Talent and The Voice, like, did you, did you all like think like this is the beginning of the snowball, or did y'all think like this is probably gonna be the peak of our group? Like we hit our goal. This no. Is we are, the three of us are completely delusional, inflated, like, we, we thought that was, I mean, it was just the beginning, but we really thought it was just the beginning. We mm -hmm. were like, the, the, the stars are the limit. Yeah. You know, we, we wanted to be, um, and I think, you know, uh, we still want to be some sort of pop star. Mm -hmm. That's like the goal in mind with our drag. Stuff has changed and like we, life has happened and we've grown and changed as people and as, as artists, mm -hmm. um, but, you know, that is still that that kind of lifestyle and those kinds of gigs, those kinds of um, venues that's still highly attractive to us as vocalists. Mm -hmm. But with Stephanie's Child, like you developed this reputation as like the trio and you know, Jan got on Drag Race, you follow shortly after. Uh, but why do you think Laguna Blue got the short end of the stick, though? What, do you, <laughs> what was wrong with her tape or her as a human being? I have two. I have two. I have several theories, but I have um, for those of you who don't know, Laguna Blue is probably the most talented out of the three of us. Mm -hmm. Like, like full T, she is absolutely incredible at everything. She's an a, a, impeccable makeup artist, um, <clears throat> a phenomenal singer and mm -hmm. musician. Um, you feel she, obligated to say that? No, no, she really, she, <laughs> no, she really is. Okay. She's, she's really good. Um, I mean, I there's, there's either they got done with me and they were like, all right, we've tried two of these cunts. Like, we, we, we're, we're done with this group. Like, this is trash. We're not, we're, this is not what we thought it was going to be. Or I have this, like, no, I'm not pinning it on myself. I think, you know, Laguna's just still hasn't had her time. Mm. But I do have this, like, theory maybe that, because RuPaul sometimes will talk about, um, Lawrence has talked about it, actually, on, on this show. Mm -hmm. uh, Lawrence Cheney has talked about how... On Drag Race Live? Uh, no, no, on, on, oh, on, on Drag Race. On your show. Oh, on my show. On oh, your okay. show. <laughs> I was like, I was like Lawrence, Lawrence, has, Lawrence has talked about, um, you know, RuPaul mentioning Lawrence's tape and quoting Lawrence's tape. And, and the idea that RuPaul actually sees... Um, you know, some of these tapes and really watches them and, and, and takes stock in them. There's part of me that just feels like maybe RuPaul has seen one of Laguna's Drag Race tapes and has been like, you know, I'm really not going to be doing this forever and we got to go out with a bang. So we're going to just file her. It's going to ruin her. She's going to be, mm. she's, she's going to be pissed for a few years, but we need to save her for last. I feel mm -hmm. like, because I feel like when Laguna's on Drag Race, she could very well win. And I think that's, that's my like very romantic mm. theory. Um, but the great thing about Laguna is that, um, I mean, she could definitely, we can all use the platform. It's it's afforded me a tremendous amount of opportunity. You know, I'm so grateful and indebted to Drag Race. But, you know, Laguna, even without the platform, is like moving mountains and doing so much amazing creative stuff. Mm -hmm. She works so hard and, you know, she has listenership and viewership of her content. So her music is great. If y'all, this is this is an ad. This, this entire interview is an ad for Laguna Blue. <laughs> go and stream her music. Go follow her, Laguna Blue NYC. Mm -hmm. Not to be confused with Laguna Blue Orlando. You know who that is? Is Morphine. I did a gig with Morphine. Morphine is just like Laguna Blue. Backstage, I was like, y'all. Yeah, I had my best friend with me. We were both mm -hmm. gagged. We were like, this is Laguna. This is like Laguna Junior. This is crazy. Mm -hmm. So basically what you're saying, though, is that like you and Jan are lying in wait for Laguna to get on to kickstart the pop career, the inevitable pop career. I don't know what's going to happen. You're waiting for that last I think, I think, cog to hit I, in the wheel. Well, maybe, but I, I think it's more than that. I think I, I do believe that we will come back together, um, and I think it will be absolutely fucking sickening. Mm -hmm. But I do think that, you know... <laughs> I say we were young when we started. I was 28 when I started doing drag. I was mm. almost 30. And I like I don't know. I think I think as artists, as drag creatures, we had so much to explore on our own and we became so solidified in unison right off the bat that I think we needed some more space to figure out who we were as people and artists and that's what we're doing now. Mm -hmm. Um and so, yeah, I do think we'll come back together and make glorious music one day. But, I mean, it'll be glorious and so much better because of the time that we spend, you know, solidifying ourselves as solo artists. Mm -hmm. So that, that feels like a very, like, 
music interview question, like Destiny's Child after the breakup. It's like, oh, the love is still there. Everything's great. Maybe someday. Well, I don't Tell have us the, the real tea. Tell us how you really feel. You didn't think she'd get on because she's not shit. She'll never be shit. Tell us how you really feel. I don't feel that way. That's, I literally don't. It's better don't. for the algorithm and the sound bites if you're, if you, you know, you're shady, but it's fine. I'll be shady. I'll be shady about, about, about some stuff, but not about my, not about my, okay, we'll shift to Jan this. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> but like, how'd you guys like, did you guys meet in drag or as singers first? No, in drag. In drag. In drag. Because as we were talking, like singing is not like a prevalent thing. Was there like a, a bar where they're doing like drag karaoke and you guys all there mingled? There was a or, competition. Or is, or is it very kind of like the night or music biopics where they're in the is alley it and they're just or is it biopic? I'm. It's driving me crazy because I keep hearing biopic, and to me, just a speaker of the English language, I'm like I, I read that as biopic, and that sounds so epic. I, I don't think people like the word biopic. I think they prefer cis pick, but I could be wrong. <laughs> But like I imagine it's just like you guys are just like one of these is singing outside and the other one joins kind of like barbershop quartet style. Then you're all just like doo wopping in the middle of an alley. No, actually, it was similar. It's actually it's kind like of like that. I um, we there was this competition back then that Britta Filter hosted. Mm -hmm. It was called Lady Liberty, and it was so this, when you won. I won it, but Jan won it the cycle before me. And Laguna and I were neck and neck to I'm to win sensing, it. Sensing a theme here. Uh huh. Well, Laguna decided not to go to the finals because she, at the time, had um, a survival job as mm -hmm. a nanny, and went on a Disney cruise with her family, and which made it far easier for me to take the crown mm -hmm. uh, that year. Who knows what would have happened um, had she stayed and put herself first instead of those fucking kids? But. Um, <laughs> Yeah, no, uh, I won that cycle, and the producer of the event said to me, hey, like, you know, last year when Jam won, I helped her, you know, create this, like, um, solo cabaret show as uh, as Chris Jenner. It was called I Am Chris. It was very, very funny. Um, it was so good. And, you know, he said, is there something that I can help you do? Is there a show that you want to produce? And I had just started doing drag. Mm -hmm. Like, this was this competition was my debut as Rosé. Your eyebrow was, like, slowly creaking behind the glue as he was talking to you. Oh, the eyebrow, which one? Girl, <laughs> the eyebrows were, were wackadoodle. I looked crazy back then <laughs> on purpose though. Um, right. Now Can't. I just look crazy by accident. Um, <clears throat> but... Or no, by someone else's hand. Or like, by, go so, on, or go by on. someone yeah. else's hand. Yeah. I don't think this is crazy at all. I think you look beautiful. Thank you. Yeah. From a Definitely well-baked. Well, yes. For sure. Burnt, as we said. Burnt. A little burnt. Um, but, this, but this competition, you know, I said, you know, actually, I, there, I would love to do a solo show, but I actually really, I know that Jan and Laguna are really good singers and they're pop singers. And we have been getting along really well. We've just been getting to know each other, becoming friends over the last like month or so. I was like, I think we should sing together. I think we should do, perform as a group and maybe try and do a group show. And so they were in and then we did it. And it was, it was the very first thing we sang together. Um, it's on, it's on, there's, I can send it to you actually. It's a video. Um, it's like an Instagram story and it's, uh, it's recorded on someone's Nokia flip. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. On a pink razor. Yeah. It was, um, it was the, the Skylar sisters, like iconic, like riff, um, in three part harmony, um, from Hamilton mm. and which of course we parodied, um, and we called it the Grinder Sisters, and it went viral. Um, and that was like right off the bat. That was we had eyes on us after mm -hmm. that first show. Was this uh, pre or post Triple A Girls? Um, this was post Triple A Girls. Okay. Okay. Yeah, post Triple A Girls. Huge inspiration for sure. Okay. Always. Okay, so, sure. so like whenever you first started, that you was it more like parodies and stuff like that? Well, not like half and half. I mean, we took the singing completely seriously, mm -hmm. and our 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 goal was to just show up and do what we did, which was like gag with the vocals. But you know it was drag, so we would do parodies. We we had a sense of humor about it, and what people fell in love with, aside from the vocals, was the chemistry on stage, um, mm -hmm. because we were just such great friends, and it was just so fun. The shows were just so fun. Mm -hmm. um, people loved the shows. My parents used to come up to all of them. Um, God, it was such a great time. Mm -hmm. Our Christmas show was like to die for. Oh. I hope one day we can do it again. It was so good. Yeah, I mean, y'all still live in New York, don't you? Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, but right like, down the street from me. Yeah, but like, do we live yeah. anywhere? Do I, I? I don't know where I live. I'm. I live in Vegas right now. We get it. You're booked, but you know, but they're still there, so you just you just call them up. <laughs> no, we're when all, you're in town. We're all over the place. <laughs> <laughs> you shady cunt. <kind. laughs> but but uh, what came first for you? Though? Like your love of singing or your love of acting, or was it just like in tandem? Singing. I was always a singer. I, I started singing when I was very young, and I had my first solo in the Christmas pageant in Scotland mm. um, at Peter Cooter Primary, and I was six years old, and I had the Deck the Hall solo, and it was sickening. 
It was fucking... How I old did you say you were? I was six. Six. I was sax, and it was suckening, and it was... I cracked on the first note, very me, but it was, like, still so mm. gorge. It's, it's like Alicia Keys at the Super Bowl. Like, one little crack, but other than that, it was... No, because mine, it lasts forever. It wasn't edited after five oh, okay. minutes. So, yeah. The, <laughs> it is... the world rem- remembers my crack. Partially yeah. because I keep doing it. As you mentioned, like you did grow up in Scotland whenever you were very young. How, how did your upbringing differ from the U.S. versus in Scotland? Well, Scottish people are very different than American people. And so my upbringing continued to be different when we moved to America because my parents were still Scot. We were all Scottish, but, you know, mm-hmm. we, we lived in a Scottish house just in Texas. Um, and, yeah, I don't know. I, I kind of, I've, it's really, I love being around. I love going to the UK. I love going to Scotland. I love being around Scottish people mm-hmm. and just people from the UK in general because it, it brings about, first of all, I start speaking in my accent. My accent kicks in, um, which is like this part of myself that just is like latent. It's like asleep and then just it, without thinking about it, it just starts when my ears pick up on it. Yeah. I share a dressing room right now with Lawrence Cheney. I was about to ask. And it's so fun. Because, like, half the day, half the day, I'm just, you know, we're talking shy, talking just mm-hmm. like this. And then normally I'm, you know, I don't, I don't know. I, at this point in my life, I'm, like, in my mid-30s now. I don't, I think ha- half of what I think, like, my inner monologue is in Amer- is, like, an American voice, this. Mm-hmm. And half of it is in a Scottish. And I mm-hmm. think it, but I'm not cognizant of it. Um, it's not something that I like. I like catch myself. I'm like, oh, it's just a part of you. It's almost like split personalities, but it's just a slight accent change. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's imagine like Coco's like trying to get ready, and it's just the sound of bagpipes coming from another dressing room. <laughs> <laughs> just like solos. <laughs> yeah, but it's Derek. <laughs> yeah, but it's Derek. Yeah, <laughs> singing. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you mentioned in interviews before that uh, whenever you came to the United States, like you assumed that it was going to be a bunch of like desert dwelling Americans with cowboy hats. But like, what was? How did I mentioned it, this in an interview before. You might have or might have been somewhere I, okay. I don't even know where, I don't know where I find this information I, I don't cite my sources I get the information it's in there it's yeah in the you cart, don't cite your sources it, but everyone who sits in this chair gags at, at the fact that you have the info yeah yeah and but all, people are always like well I'm where, not where'd gagging. you learn that what are you talking about <laughs> what did I say yeah you, you said that when you came to America like you had an expectation of like what Americans were going to be like and then they, it wasn't like that at all like, yeah I mean it was very well first of all we moved to like uh suburban like suburbia Houston mm-hmm. in the middle of the summer in 1998. So I had seen in school a couple of Western films. Mm -hmm. You know, I had an idea of like what Hollywood was, but I was was like just nine years old when I moved to America. So I I wasn't that with it yet, mm-hmm. um, as far as like the global culture goes. I w- was shocked to to find like how hot it was. The fact that everybody in Texas had a pool in their backyard that was a gag. Mm-hmm. Um, that the houses were huge. Um, Do you have a pool? My I growing up in Texas, I did above ground or below ground. On what does that mean? Like on the ground? Like one is like, like in, in the, the ground. The, in the is standing up on the on no the grass. no no in in the in the ground. Oh, so you have money. Did we? Is that what that means? I probably used to. Well, we moved to America probably. probably with not that much, and and we were renting a house at first, and it had a pool. Oh, but I, I think that was something my mom said to my dad. She was like, "You go and find us a house with a pool." <laughs> 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 and thank God he did, because she just roasted in in the, by that pool every damn day. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I don't know. Um, it was there was a lot of. I remember one of the biggest things that was shocking to me culture shock was the food. Mm-hmm. Um, because just going, going grocery shopping, there was a lot of things as a child that were just so different and it blew my mm-hmm. mind. Yogurt was one of them. Not that I've ever been like yogurt. a connoisseur of yogurt. I've never mm-hmm. eaten or known that much about yogurt, but the- Just the, the idea of its existence. There was like, there, like, there was like the, the packaging and the mm-hmm. texture of, of some, some brand of, or, or like of some type of yogurt that we were buying was completely different than it was in Scotland. Candy, chocolate, like mm-hmm. Hershey's chocolate, I'll I love it now, but like it took so much getting used to because it's like chalky British chocolate is so much smoother and more mm. delicious. It's like so so good. Um, yeah, I don't know. Oh, also, but... also just like like it was it's it was diversity. It mm. was it was diversity in in the kinds of people that were around me. Mm. When I this is at the time when I moved to America, the the elementary school I went to was like awarded or or recognized or at least listed um, mm-hmm. as being like the most culturally diverse uh, school, like school district mm-hmm. in maybe in Texas, if not in Houston. And, uh, and that is not the way it was in Scotland. Almost everybody was white. Mm-hmm. Um, 
So there was just so much to take in and, and so much to 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 get used to. It was really exciting. Mm -hmm. It was a really exciting time in my life. The two biggest culture shocks was like seeing different people and like yogurt dan animals. Yeah. yeah. It's like the two big things. Being nine is fucked. Yeah. <laughs> but um, I, I know, like, I, I grew up in a very small town as well, like, predominantly white. We had a couple um, foreign exchange students that come in every now and then. And they were always, like, popular kids, but it was very, like, animal at the zoo. Is that how you felt in your town, like, being a very Scottish child in so, the middle of Texas? So, yes and no. I took, this is why I, I speak um, most of the time now with an American voice, is because... Mm -hmm. I picked up on. I remember when I when I did move to the states. I was kind of I was bullied a lot, like mm. in school. Period, for, for being so for for being so okay. I was, I was like, which reason? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, no, for being so effeminate. And I uh, when I moved to America, I remember thinking like, okay, like new school, new country. Mm. You got this. Like you're gonna go in there. You're gonna you're gonna just like make friends. You're gonna make so many friends, and immediately even though it was there was so much diversity and it was easier to kind of like f f fit in to i don't know my own little slot or whatever i sounded completely different than e everybody else mm -hmm. and i was like and i was so i was so soft spoken and had like just such a little pretty you know speaking voice i i was so polite when i was a kid so I don't know i i just was like i have to change something here so i that's when i became a performer and i Started going to school, talking like this. I just picked it up. An American dialect, like a mm. standard American dialect, is so easy to learn. It's lazy. It's the, it is the laziest way to talk. You just mm. roll your fucking mouth around. Mm. It's like it's like you're eating. Yeah. You also have like your pick of the later with like dialects. You can choose whatever. You know. Again, being in Houston, there's probably a lot of different ways of people speaking. So you're right. Southern probably being there's the most some prominent. there's some like real country folk, and then there's some <clears throat> that sound more. Just like they're mm -hmm. from the Midwest. Was there any other Scottish kids? Was it just you? Um, there were there were Scottish kids and and kids from England and and what the teachers would do. Not I was I was in fourth grade when mm -hmm. I moved to America. But y'all roll together. What little Scottish kids y'all roll together? So yeah. So so my brother <clears throat> was in kindergarten and in like the like one of the other kindergarten classes there was another little Scottish boy mm -hmm. and so the teachers were like oh my god let's tell the moms because they're they're immigrants mm -hmm. they just got here. How fun! And so they did. And now, like you know, the, those they became our they they had other siblings, and they became our cousins. And <clears throat> we created like a a UK community within um, Sugarland, which is the suburb I grew up in in Houston. Um, and now those are like my aunties and uncles, and you know, it's like you know, like unofficially, mm -hmm. it's like this little Scottish collective in the middle yeah. of Houston. Yeah, yeah, and we all still keep in touch. Um, they've all since all the kids have grown up, they've. Kind of dispersed a little bit, but for the most part, they live in the Houston area, which is quite a lot of space to to account for. But we, I still see those people like like every year. It's mm -hmm. really nice. But I'm just imagining like a, like in Texas, there's just like this little collective of little sunburnt people out in the middle of Houston. That was us by the pool. Yeah, just hanging out. That was us going in, to the in beach the, in the below ground pool. In the below yeah. ground pool. Yeah, that, that's a thing like uh, in the U.S. where it's like people that want to feel a little wealthier but don't have the means they get above ground pools that makes sense that, dollars. that makes sense it lasts like a summer before someone pops it or something yeah yeah, yeah yeah i know i know the vibe no where i grew up where i grew up a lot of the houses had um had pools like just like in the it was it was just like part of the mm -hmm. this is the plans for that for the, the house the home building in the neighborhoods a lot of the homes had pools what, what was your reasoning for moving to the u.s was it um, like for your work my dad's or, job your dad's job yeah can I ask what he did? Yeah, he was a drag queen. Oh, mm -hmm. that makes sense. Yeah, a really bad one. Oh, yeah. the apple didn't fall far from the well, tree. Houston drag, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <Mistress>. <laughs> but, but what did you, like your family, your is came like for work, just coming to the U.S. or? Yeah, no, my dad, my dad's a, a, a draftsman. He's an engineer. And so he designs oh. ships and things like that in the ocean. And so he, um, we moved around a lot when I was a kid for him. And I think I'm the eldest of three. So when... Mm -hmm. When he got the chance to move us over to the States and they took it, it became a good opportunity for them to settle down. Mm -hmm. And they're still there. Um, but my parents did just buy a house in Scotland. Um, they're there right now checking it out. They mm -hmm. just sent me a bunch of videos today and it's really cute. Oh, amazing. Yeah, it's like it's like really close to where we're all from. Yeah. Um, where our, our relatives still live. So you have the Airbnb checked out whenever you go back home? Go right. Back and visit. So now, so now I can, mm -hmm. uh, every time I go uh, perform in... 
in London or something, I'll, I'll pop up to Scotland. And... Have, have you performed back in your hometown since Drag Race ever happened? I have. I actually had one of, I mean, it, it, I was so, I wish I had made a bigger deal of it in uh -huh. my mind then, but I feel like most things are like this when it's all just happening. Mm -hmm. Um, cause I thought it would be like, uh, this will be like every year and it won't be every year. It'll happen again. But like it, it was a, such a dream come true when work the world, first of all, work the, the work, the world that happened, the first one that happened after the pandemic, mm -hmm. my, my first work, the world, um, which was the year after like the drive and drag that show was sold in 2019 and people had to wait during the pandemic for it to then come out on oh. tour. So it was, it was so well sold and so eagerly anticipated. Mm -hmm. So like that, those shows in Europe were, and like they, in, in the UK, they, they were so fun and mm -hmm. so big. Historically, I think that year we did the largest drag show that has ever happened in humanity. And it was, I think 9,000 at Manchester Arena. Oh my gosh. Um, which is crazy. And in the same week we did, we did Glasgow, which is the area that I'm from and where Lawrence is from too. Mm -hmm. um, and we did the Hydro and it was, I wanna say 8,000 8, people were there and it was the homecoming I had, the people, I have videos of like my, you know, Asia let me, Asia was the host, Asia O'Hara, and you know, she let me come out and talk to them in a Scottish accent and I mm -hmm. like drank a can of Iron Brew, it's like the Scottish national soda. I actually do. And, and like, I mean, just that the whole, the whole arena was chanting my name while I was performing and it was so magical. Um, so yes, I've, I've gone back and I have felt so much love from the, the Scottish mm -hmm. people I'm really, I'm really lucky to have that support. Actually, I, I don't take it for granted because mm -hmm. you don't get it here in the U.S. I don't so get it's it nice here in the to know that somewhere out Definitely there. Definitely don't feel yeah. it here in Vegas. <laughs> yeah, but as far as like support in the U.S. though, like um, you said, you were bullied a little bit for being like effeminate in high school or in school in general. Was that something that followed you all the way up until college, or was it really just like when you first moved to? The U.S. That that no, 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 no. That. Bullying followed me through through school, but when I was in high school. Well, when I was in middle school, I started to be like, I started to turn it. And then people were like, oh, wait, she's like really sickening. Mm -hmm. And so I always had this thing. I was always very lucky because as much as I was a target for bullying and so much strange formats of, of hatred um, and like, you know, straight Christian grooming, mm -hmm. um, I was I was so lucky growing up in even in conservative envir environments because I am talented and because I always had something that people like people would be like there's you know there's God in his voice mm -hmm. you know there's Jesus is here and like people you got bullied by Joan Rivers people, yeah <laughs> yeah she was a fan yeah and, until she wasn't yeah and look what happened she was picking on some middle uh, school kid <laughs> yeah no she uh, <laughs> yeah I start talking about Joan Rivers no. um, yeah people people were would would make space for me and and make yeah well, he's all right. He, I wasn't like out yet until I was near You're the one end of the high ones. school. But I, well, like the people tolerated me and and put me on a pedestal because, because of the way I could sing, mm -hmm. uh, frankly. And and so that was that that saved me a lot of of grief when it came to, honestly, I would say more bullying. I I, I suffered from bullying from parents as, as and administrators as well as mm. as children in Texas. Um, oh, like not your parents, other people's parents. Not my parents. My parents okay. are wonderful. Um, my parents have always done the best they could to understand your and parents like kick you in the pool. <laughs> yeah, they they did that too. Um, oh yeah, for other reasons. But <laughs> I wasn't like bullied, bullied in high school. Um, even like though I had hadn't quite come out yet. Um, I was, but I there was a lot of. I, it was it was a very uncomfortable experience mm. for me um, to try and get by. Again, Texas is a, a real, obviously, a really horribly conservative place, mm -hmm. and um, if I go, I go back. Oh my god, my glove is like falling apart. I go back often because my family's there and I love seeing them, but I rarely leave their house. You need to take your um, drag more seriously. I, I take back what I said earlier about doing real drag when you're here. You're falling apart. Amazon. These are actually custom. But they're old. Oh, you can get your money back. And I just had them taken in because my arm was fatter when I got them. Oh, the Ozempic? No, it wasn't Ozempic. No. It wasn't Ozempic. <laughs> no, you, some of us, some of us just like lose weight, like sometimes, you know. And some people say when they're on Ozempic, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I have nothing against Ozempic, girl. Yeah. <laughs> except, except, don't you have to like Ozempic? You have to like, sh like do it yourself. Mm. <sighs> I, I'm, I, I'm, I'm scared. I, of I, I don't. I don't it's not a tattoo I, needle. I'm like. 
I, I don't know about that. I, I grew up poor. That that's for people with you pools. You have one of those above that's ground pools. Right, yeah, yeah, I had an above ground pool. I don't know about yeah. Ozempic and oh, I got it. Talented. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> but as you mentioned, like being in the theater and being in choir. When, when did you really get into theater? Because I know like your dad took you to plays when you were like fifteen. Were you in the theater before or after that? Um, before I I started theater. When I was in middle school and was part of a really, like, really fucking talented group of young actors and performers at at my middle school and then, you know, mm -hmm. my high school as well. We all grew up together. I was probably in seventh grade when I was in my first, like, musical or play. And I think my first musical was Into the Woods. I played Jack. Oh, I played one of the princes. Really? Which yeah. one? Into the Woods? I don't remember. Rapunzel or Cinderella? Um... Or if you watch the, the video of Blonde or Brunette. It's a long time ago. I distinctly remember like sliding into the scene with like saying, I have the maiden slipper. So you, that was that one. Oh, well, who knows though? Oh, it's small school. They're it, working together. Yeah, yeah. It could have been any one of them. Exactly. That's what I'm saying. I don't really care. <laughs> okay, damn. But for you like in school, like what was theater for you? Was it just like, like fun? Was it like an aspiration or was it just like escapism for you? Like what was theater to you? Theater was where I put all my energy. Theater and choir were where I put like all of my creativity and all of my ideas. Um, yeah. I, it, 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 it was my life. It was my life. It was my life. And it, it was my dream too. Mm -hmm. And once I started doing it and realized that I was good at it, um, I got bit by the bug being like, fuck, I want to do this when I get older. Like, I want to do this, like, forever. Mm -hmm. um, At what point did that shift start to happen, though, between going from, like, oh, this is fun, I want to put a lot of effort into, the, into this, versus, oh, this could be the rest of my life. Like, when did, like, that realization happen? Oh, very young. Oh. I, I decided when I was very young, I was like, I, wanted, I want to do this. I want to be famous. I want to be, I want to be an artist who people know. I want to... I want. I had. I have dreams that I've that I had. I have fulfilled, and dreams that I have yet to fulfill. Mm -hmm. A huge one is I, of course, still want to be on Broadway, which will happen. It just has to be the right show at the right time. Mm -hmm. what, what what kind of roles are you looking for, like in Broadway? Are you just like anything, or is it like certain like? Um, do you get typecasted? No, not anymore. No. Uh, not anymore. There was this fabulous article that came out in Playbill, and it was in the printed Playbills and Broadway shows for the month of June for Pride last year um, about me. And, and it was, it was. Uh, Are you talking about like your dream roles and stuff? It was, it was me, they, they took me to, Playbill took me to this, this gorgeous giant costume warehouse in Queens mm -hmm. and in New York City and they, they let me pick and they helped costume me um, in, in some roles that I would love to play both in and out of drag, which was like kind of a mind fuck for me because I actually hadn't really thought about what that, possibility or capability was even though I am doing this now in my life and mm -hmm. it's obviously you know I think I think really Jinx Monsoon has moved mountains by by her star performance in Chicago it's mm -hmm. it her star turn in Chicago it's it's like it really opened my eyes and a lot of people's eyes up to be like oh my gosh like gender in theater is so it mean it I, it means nothing either like mm -hmm. it's, it's it's just we don't need to follow by any of these rules yeah. and i started to realize i was like wow there are there are roles in there are shows that i've fallen in love with where i did one recently um i did a, a production of the wizard of oz and i played glinda mm -hmm. and i have always thought if I ever was in the, a production of The Wizard of Oz, which at this point in my drag career, I'm like, I'm not going to be in a production of The Wizard of Oz. I'd be the Tin Man. I'm, I'm a Tin Man. That's probably who I'd be. Or maybe a Scarecrow. When they asked me to come in for Glinda, I was shocked. I was like, I was like, I've, it had never even crossed my mind. Mm -hmm. And when I was doing the show, when I was, you know, learning the material and performing it in the during the run, I was like, I don't know who else I would be in the show. I am this character. I am this, I am this like, wise witch who is like where who is mysterious and wears pink all the time mm -hmm. and you know it i it, it's 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 completely opened my mind up to what casting can be so no there's like there's no end to like what i would like to do mm -hmm. um in theater and especially of course on broadway but there's also rules that that, that that wouldn't um that wouldn't be persuaded by drag you know like i still have like i would love to play my favorite musical is hair the mm -hmm. musical when I was in college, the musical Hair changed my life. And my I, I said right then and there, I was like, at some point when I'm a little bit older, I have to play Burger. I have to play um, Burger and Hair. And I think I'm like at the age now where it makes sense to do it. Mm -hmm. um, 
I should do it soon because I have long hair right now and I'm yeah. dying to cut well, it off. That's also a role for like your 30s and like so you don't have a lot of time left. You got to get that one. 30s, 40s, there's time. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> you make an older burger. <laughs> Yeah. They won't notice from the nosebleed. Girl, It'll be fine. Yeah, I don't know. I'm uh, knock on wood, but like I'm lucky. Like I I don't I read like in and out of drag, I read a little bit younger always than I actually am. Hmm. So let's see how long that lasts. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Shout out to the doc my doctor. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Dismore. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> Love you. What's what's uh, Michelle's doctor's name? She's always like Dr. Dismore. <laughs> oh, oh he's Dismore. Dr. Okay. Dismore. Thank you, Dr. Dismore. Uh-huh. <laughs> But for you, do you view your drag as theater or just like a different art form altogether? Like, how do you view rosé? Rosé, I mean, rosé is, rose, when I, I don't know. Is rosé you or is rosé a character? Rosé, I've, I've always say, said that rosé is like the most elevated version of of Ross, of, of me. Mm-hmm. Um, like, it, it's not, it, it's a, it has been at times, especially in the beginning, more sticky, more mm-hmm. of a character. Um, but as I've grown into like the drag artist that I am um and just as you know my own concept of gender has evolved and 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 where I am on that spectrum I I realize that that rosé is just a facet of of who I am it's not a character mm. but I do I do think that my drag is is very theatrical mm. and I love when I'm on stage to like really bring the drama mm. so so drag is theater to me for sure but also not. But also, like, kind of not. Mm-hmm. But then, yes. <laughs> but also, no. But also, no. But sometimes. Or was it? Maybe. What was it on a uh, on season sixteen? What did that bitch say? She said. She said. She said. No, when I started, and yes, when I finished. What? What's her name? <laughs> um, is it Geneva? I'm. I just caught up with all of six, season sixteen. I am living for y'all. I am uh-huh. living for y'all. By the time this episode comes out, it's probably gonna be close to the finale. But Geneva Carr, that's her name. Geneva Carr, yeah. Geneva Carr. Geneva Vroom Vroom Carr. Um, so funny. I'm loving the season of Drag Race. Do you watch yeah. Drag Race still? I watch it. Did you have a period where you like where you where you felt l- less comfortable watching it, where it didn't bring you as much joy because you had been on it? Uh, yeah, my season. <laughs> Really? Yeah, like just act, your season? Actively watch. I watched. I watched my season. God, I hate hearing myself in recordings. I'm, I'm more comfortable with it now, obviously. But like yeah. when the season happened, hearing my voice, seeing myself on a screen. Well, it, no. it's it's most of our first time, yeah. and so it like or in somewhere or another. So like we do learn. I mean, mm-hmm. I learned so much about myself yeah. from from that first go around on on being on TV every week. But it was. I mean, yeah. I I think this is the. It's taken me a good three years to feel really disconnected now from season 13 mm-hmm. in a way where I can like really love Drag Race as much as I always yeah. like have and like used to. Mm-hmm. Um, it's just, it, it taints your experience when you're there because yeah. I mean, it causes all sorts of, you know, newness in your life, both amazing and terrible, mm-hmm. all, frankly. And and I don't know, I think I'm like on a different plane now. So I'm, mm-hmm. le- have, having said that, I love season 16. You're saying, you've gone to therapy is what you're saying. You've processed I have gone to, it. I, I, you've that is one of the many things I have done, yes. With watching my season, it was hard watching my season, but I, I enjoyed the next season after it and like season 16. But uh, it definitely made it where now I want to go back and watch old seasons with a new lens because on the show, like you notice different things now. Yeah. But, yeah. Oh, when I was there, not me, bitch. When I was there, I was one of the. I was very well studied. I was a Drag Race super fan, and I. I was like. I was like Candy. I was mm. almost at Candy level. Candy Muse can like clock like. You walk like, in, you're like, I've cracked the code. I, I had cracked I think, a lot of the code. I think Candy's one of the few people that actually cracked the code. A Candy's lot, definitely. A lot of people say they Candy have. Is, Candy has cracked the code. Yeah, she yeah. cracked it. She cannot figure out for the life of her how to win, but she has definitely cracked the code. Yeah, you know, <laughs> always a bridesmaid. Yeah. I think. Well, I think she just she went there and she's like she fulfilled a role and that role was like runner up. You know, the bridesmaid. It is what it is. Maybe I want her to get her crown though one day. I think she'll be too powerful. I don't think she needs that. No, let her have it. No, people get hurt. Let them have it. But talking about, talking about your drag journey, on your Wikipedia page, it says that you started drag in 2017. But mm. as is the trend with you know, theater kids, there's always times before that you actually were in drag. I want to trace it back to the first time you really got into drag, performing. Mm-hmm. So going back to 2015, you were in the play Pageant as Miss Industrial Northeast. Wait, let me see that. That's literally okay. So like amazing that you have gathered this, but that's actually not me. How's that is my you? friend who I was thinking about earlier, Sheridan. I was just thinking about my friend Sheridan McMichael. Mick Michael? It's hard to tell Michael? from a distance because you wore like almost the exact same dress like in the same play. 
It looks like me. Then, well, I have another picture, so we'll put that one on the screen of the one that is for sure you. Okay. I tried because like that one's hard to you're in between people, mm -hmm. but 2015 you were that a pageant. Was, that was as the Miss first. Industrial that was my Northeast. that was my real first my real first intro to drag, and it was in Oklahoma City, where <clears throat> the the drag in OKC is fierce. It is pageant down, mm -hmm. and um, it's where my drag family in New York originated, mm -hmm. and which is very special to me. But they they, you know the the costume designer um, is a drag queen at mm -hmm. that theater re residentially working and so he brought in some of the girls from from the community to like and hired yeah. them to help to teach us how to beat our faces and and how to do this and that and you know they made us pads and it was it was like uh, a theater it was and this is like before kinky boots was a thing mm -hmm. so um or actually i think kinky boots had like just started but it was like so crunchy mm -hmm. and theater theater drag is just never the same as like yeah. drag drag it, yeah. ju it just isn't well, Fred and I, it gets crunchier because in 2014, you also showcased this late young lady. <laughs> oh my God. You look like Tina Belcher, but. <laughs> no, I look like my ballet teacher. teacher. My ballet teacher's name is Denise, Denise Celestin. And she, mm -hmm. um, I don't even know if she pronounces her name French. Like, she's probably going to watch that and be like, first of all, she's not going to watch this. But she, you don't she, know. she, she, she was obsessed with audience. purple. She was obsessed with purple and she, she wore this outfit every day. And mm -hmm. for Halloween one day, I was in a piece for a, a, a dance concert and I was playing the, the role of the ballet master mm -hmm. and I came as her and she was literally wearing this that day. It was mm -hmm. so fun. Yeah, but this girl, is- Girl, that is Scoocherello drag, girl. This is, this is the furthest back that I could find until I found this from 2012. Oh my what God. Is, uh, so is this is, the first, is this the first time you performed in drag? Okay, first of all, the first time I performed a drag, I was probably four years old. I'm not talking about like in a living room. I'm talking about like this on, is like in, the in front room, of girl. people. I'm talking. I'm, I'm saying like not the little four year old, but like on a stage or in front of an audience. 2012. Yeah, this would have been. This is 2012. This might have been. This might have been 2009. It was posted in 2012. So over 2009, it's even. Further it might be back. 2009. Yeah. This was this this character's name was Lolita, and this was in a production of The Boyfriend, with. Um, in a with a light opera company in Tulsa. Mm -hmm. This was my very first professional professional gig that summer. I was my first time doing summer stock theater. I was mm -hmm. it was after my sophomore year of college. I was like 20 years old. And yes, for a brief scene, I put on a bunch of blush and a mm -hmm. skirt and did a and did a partner dance. It really was just blush too cuz like there's no other it's makeup. Blush and it's just... There was no time for it. It, 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 I mean again, it's not like it's like it's like spooky it's camp, camp, camp theater it's drag. It's not, it's not giving drag. It's literally the exact opposite of what Tina Burner gave you because she gave you everything but blush. So Thank it's you. it's so crazy, like in hindsight. It know? is it is it is a cloud of a certain color concentrated somewhere on my face. Right. <laughs> and and nothing more. So but like prior to that, like you can't think of any other performances you did. Like that's as far back. Why? What else you what else do you fucking have? You trying that's to roast all I have me? right now. That was the twenty twelve no, I mean, or, or two thousand nine. No, it, it I don't think so. So we think Lolita might have been like the first. I one. think Lolita was probably the very first time that I performed for a paying audience or an audience in general in like actual mm -hmm. drag. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But talking about whenever you were like younger, like four years old in the living room, like what, what were you doing? Just like dancing around? Or? I was making <clears throat> my brother play What's His Tits um, in Mary Poppins, Dick Van Dyke. Mm. Um, while I was Mary, and I would play Step in Time, the big tap number, the mm -hmm. chimney sweeps at the end. Mm -hmm. We would, I would play it over and over. I would have a towel skirt and a towel wig, and he had a little hat, and we would, I would choreograph it. We, I, my poor brother, um, I would make him do so many scenes with me when we were growing up, where I was the girl and he was the boy. <laughs> the signs were there. <laughs> the signs, girl. <laughs> What signs? It, just, it was happening. It was happening. <laughs> um, I was doing, yeah, I was doing all sorts of things like that. I guess the first time I ever did drag, my, my, I was probably like six years old, and my cousin, my older cousin Mary, f face painted me for Halloween and made me like alphabet green with like a, mm -hmm. and I and I chose. I I loved wearing towels as wigs. I loved doing that, and I loved and I loved tucking them behind my ear. Ah. Uh, but like, uh, but I chose a pink one. I thought that was really funny because in that picture, pink now I, I chose pink hair, which of course is my mm -hmm. my long lost signature the, look. The seed the seeds were planted long ago. Yeah, you're just now you're just now reaping what you sowed at the age of like four years old. Yeah. 
Oh, whatever you, you're talking about, that play you did in 2015, like the pageant, yes. and you worked with actual drag queens, what, was that like, at that moment, did you start to think that you, drag might be something you would pursue? Or did that come like later? I used to joke, I used to joke, because well, I also, I for, during college, like around the same time in Halloween, mm -hmm. Halloween one year, I did drag, and I, I actually, it was like, I was like still giving like mage twink, I was very young, so like my bone structure hadn't like fully developed, and I still had like, a little soft little jaw. So I actually, even with like, you know, bare bones makeup and mm -hmm. like no knowledge of what I was doing, I actually looked kind of pretty. And I remember saying, I was like, you know, as a joke, I was like, if if theater doesn't work out, if film doesn't work out, if this, if acting doesn't work out, like maybe drag will be my backup career. Like ha 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 in the back of my mind. And it's so funny how it actually, it became the, not only the focus, but like the, the breadwinner, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, and, yeah. and, and a vessel for me being an actor. Um, mm -hmm. It's funny how life works. He's like, when you start doing drag, you're like, this might be a cute little, you know, side distraction, side hustle, and now it's, you're literally going around When I started doing drag, I was just fucking sick of everything. I was sick of theater. I was sick of being put in a box. I was sick of feeling like I was oh. typecast. I was typecast mm -hmm. before. Now I'm not. Now I make the rules. So, so like drag almost like from the at the beginning was almost like a well I want to make my own characters then I'm gonna do my own thing. I can That's do exactly what it was. It was like it was like I don't I'm I'm I was sick of being in other people's shows. I was sick of playing other people. I also I also just it sounds like I was being a dick, but like I I don't know. I felt like I had something to say and and I I was good on a mic and I was funny and I was quick and I was like I can I can turn this party you know in a different way and have make more of the coin have more of the have more of the attention. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah. yeah. And you, st you started doing that in uh, New York. Is it right whenever you... Started, I moved to New York 11 right, years right. ago. 11 years ago this week, I moved to New York. And I started drag nearly seven years ago. So I was about five years in New York before I started Rosé. Oh, so you were there for a minute. Yeah. So where were you at in life? Because you, you were getting frustrated with being typecasted. You started drag. Like... Other than just the unbridled anger you had for theater, like what, what were you going on through your, in your life at that point? Like, well, I was dating. Um, I was kind of coming into uh, my queerness <clears throat> a lot more than I had allowed myself to previously, mm -hmm. and I was dating this really fabulous makeup artist. Um, his name was Matt. It probably still is, but he he would go out. He was a club kid, and he would go out. You know to the Suzanne Barsh parties, the Lady Fag parties in New York, and he would bring me with him. And I had never, I like, I didn't go out. Like, if my, my concept of drag in New York or nightlife was like sometimes maybe going to see Bob the Drag Queen do a show, or Pixie mm -hmm. Aventura, or my drag mother now, Keisha yeah. Carr, you know, like, at the, uh, at the see, end of see Monet or Ms. Cracker maybe, but like, it, I, I didn't go out, I didn't have the money. I didn't have the money to go out and drink. And so I would, or to tip, so I would, I, I finally started going out and I would go to these parties and, and I was just so inspired. And so I, you know, I was encouraged by my my lover at the time. Uh, and he started to teach me more about makeup. And I started taking more risks. And some nights I looked fucking sickening. Some nights I looked ghastly. But I would, like, go out and just kind of, like, turn looks. Mm -hmm. And I don't know. It was just I was experimenting a lot. And I kind of eventually got to a point where I was, like, season nine was airing on Drag Race. Mm -hmm. So season nine was is very near and dear to my heart, that cast, you know, really informed a lot of who Rosé was at her mm -hmm. birthing point. Was it something about that cast or just what you happened to it see It was the at timing. That time? No, it was just oh, the just timing. timing. That was what was on TV. And, you know, like, I, I forever, you know, I'm forever indebted to Sasha Velour because Sasha inspired me so much. And my drag was was very creative back then too. Mm -hmm. Um there was Past there, there was very yes. Yeah. Well there was there, there was but there was very little there was very little emphasis on any sort of female illusion. There was very it wasn't about any of that stuff. It wasn't it was not about fashion. It was not about mm -hmm. it was not about some of the things that I that I do focus on more now. It was about it was about being really bold and mm -hmm. different and, and, and sticking fucking, it to the theater people. Yeah. Well, well, yeah, not just the theater people. <laughs> it just, but but to the idea that I had to, that I, I could only do this in mm -hmm. this industry playing by somebody else's rules, mm -hmm. and and feeling, and feeling like my creativity was stumped because of it, because mm -hmm. I'm a very creative person. Yeah. Um. So sometimes being an actor is not enough. But with your drag character too, you mentioned before that you actually felt more masculine in drag. Did, <laughs> I knew you were gonna bring this up. <laughs> well, I was just curious. Like, like, do you feel that way still, or what? What, no. what did you mean by that? 
Um, I'm glad I thought about this because I I was thinking I was like well, I wonder what Maddie's gonna dig up and there's an article it was it was on yeah. it was an out and it was following me winning that competition Lady mm. Liberty. Um, I'm glad I thought about this to be able to tell you now to that formulate what, a politically correct well, answer. <laughs> well, no, no, just to like make any sense of that because I think of that now and I'm like what the fuck did I mean? Mm -hmm. But what I meant was you know back then in 2017 I you know. My, my, the textbook definition of masculinity and my idea of it was, was in strength and power and dominance. Mm -hmm. And that's, those are things that I've always struggled to kind of stand in and, and, and claim for myself. Mm -hmm. um, and when I was in drag, it was this magical power that like I felt and everybody who was watching me felt and I would be on the microphone and I could tell that I had everybody on the edge of their seat and I was in charge. And and it, it to me, it it was that like supreme masculine power that I mm -hmm. had always kind of like heard about, read about, seen like men kind of perform and, and, and live in, but had never found for myself. So that's kind of, what I meant, what I what I know and see now is that really there's just so much <laughs> strength and power in being a woman mm -hmm. and in femininity. And so, um, yeah, it was really what it was is just it was was me gagging at at how confident I was because of drag. You were just girl bossing, and you're like, is this what it's bossing. like to be a man? Yeah, honestly, you girl boss too close to the sun and <laughs> learn about yourself. What happens to my eyes? <laughs> yeah. To your eyes. <laughs> Again, full circle. <laughs> um, but something to like being involved in like the New York li nightlife scene. I can attest. Like I just recently came from a gig in New York uh, because I'm booked as well. I saw. Uh, I was there on a. There's that hilarious TikTok with you and girlfriend. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I yeah. love girlfriend. I just met her. I love that bitch. Oh, she's great. She's, she's great. So fun. Uh, but I, I was in New York, and like in the South, nightclubs and bars they happen Friday, Saturday, or, like Fridays and Saturdays from ten to two. New York. It's any point of the night, every day of the week. We were out until the sun was up on a Wednesday bouncing around and stuff. Yeah. And, and I bring that up because you mentioned before that, like, you don't drink. You're sober. And what, was that something that was made worse by your time in, like, the New York nightlife scene? Worse or better, depending on your standpoint. I got a lot better at drinking, that's yeah. for sure. Um, and to clarify, I am California sober. I smoke a lot of weed. Um, right. Because there's a difference, and we should talk about that. There's different. There's different kinds of sobriety. Mm -hmm. There's different levels. Different things work for different people. Yeah. But in this case, I'm, I'm I'm referring to like the alcohol specifically. No, of course. Well, I one reason why I was so good at at drag at the beginning was, uh, and what you know, I, I was immediately booked mm -hmm. after that competition is because I was great on the mic. Like off the off the bat, but also I bitch I turned the fucking party because I loved coming to work and getting shit faced. I was so good at it, and I mean I drank a lot in my twenties, and yeah, drag. I mean, there's there's a lot of stories. There's a lot of there's a lot of behind the scenes leading up to Drag Race where it was like, will she pull through? Will she be able to do it? Because I was just so hungover all of the time, um, and really, I mean. New York nurtured that kind of alcoholism in me by my choice, by my own hand. But um, because that's the thing, you are you're you're when you're working in the bar circuit, your your job is to fill the seats and get people drinking. And I was really good at that, you know, and I was proud of that. Um, that's not really so much your job anymore. I mean, it is, but it's like, you know, when you, once you're on Drag Race, you, you don't mm -hmm. have <laughs> people are going to show up and people are going to drink. Yeah. Um, I don't know when when I it's it's less a New York thing, it's more so a nightlife thing. When season thirteen was happening, and then after for six months after season thirteen aired, was the spookiest time in my life so far, just because of the drinking. Oh, so, so New York kind of like laid a foundation, but it's post Drag Race and like traveling around. I would say Scotland laid the foundation for me. Oh yeah, well, okay, so Scotland was a foundation. Uh, New York was like the the wooden stilts, the frame of the house. Yeah. but then like Drag Race. Really, yeah. New York, New York everything. nightlife, like, really, it did a great job of, of housing and nurturing my, my alcoholism. But, but, but it was the stress and the fear and the pressure, mm -hmm. um, from from Drag Race and from from having a the huge audience I'd always wanted, 
you know, bit me in the ass because they're they're horrible. They're they're if you do something that they don't like, they make you feel if you're not used to it, especially they can make you feel worthless and very very small. And I started to feel like that all the time, and so I was just I was drinking so much, um, and it was really bad. It was really bad. Um, but I stopped. I've been I've been I've stopped drinking nearly two and a half years ago, which is so crazy. Um, and I just stopped cold turkey. And yeah, life has been so much better ever since then. Was there like a certain uh, event or something that happened that made you want to like cut yourself off? Or was it just kind of a slow build where you're like, I need to, this is getting bad? It, when you know, I, I, I had known I had an issue for years. Mm -hmm. And I constantly thought and said to myself, I never said out loud, I wouldn't dare wouldn't dare level with it. But I knew that at some point I was gonna have to stop drinking because I knew that I couldn't drink like this my whole life. It was like, I couldn't keep up with, with the world. And, but th the point at which I really had to stop, I was in a relationship and I was just so horribly mistreating that person. And when I finally saw, I finally, one day he turned around and kind of was like, look at what you're doing. You know, look at what you've become, look at who you are. Um, it gagged me. And I kind of saw myself and I was like, oh my God, I am. And I've cut friends out of my life before because of, you know, to certain drugs, but to the point where like, you know, like you just don't have that person anymore mm -hmm. because drugs consume them. Um, I, I, you look at them in their eyes and you just see black. You, there's nothing, there's nothing happening. Mm -hmm. I was becoming that. And I, and I was like, this is a person telling me that I am that. I was like, that really shook me. Mm -hmm. um, and so that, that, that meeting of our minds and that breakup is what is what provided for my sobriety. So it was very sad. Um, it's very sad that that I had to get to that point to get to that point. But I'm also very grateful for it. Mm -hmm. I know a lot of people. They when they think of themselves going sober, they're like, "Oh, I was an alcoholic, but now I'm not anymore." Do you still view yourself as like an alcoholic, or yes. is, you still do? Absolutely. Yeah, I will not touch alcohol. I respect. I I take this from my mom. My mom, um, my, my mother's mother was an alcoholic and, and she, my mom's so wise. And she said, she says, I respect alcohol. You know, she, 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 my mom drinks. My parents are, love to drink. They're social Scottish. drinkers. Yeah. Right. You know, I, 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 I take that from what my mom said. You know, I, I respect alcohol. I understand that it exists and I understand that it has a power over me. Mm -hmm. And I think that I'm pretty fucking invincible in this life I sure do but I I that is one match that I have met and so I let it be and I like I just don't touch it and I understand how grave the consequences are if someone like me is gonna drink because I cannot if I'm having one I'm having all of them mm -hmm. girl I, I'm gonna turn the party <laughs> yeah. you, you, and it's not good because you, when your life is the party yeah. it, the way it was for me it life is no longer a party it's very sad yeah. and it's it's it's, it's really, really hard to, to go downhill through. yeah yeah but as someone dealing with alcoholism would you say like in your drag career, it was a harder battle dealing with alcoholism or battling your bone structure? Like, what was the <laughs> harder battle for you? Fuck you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, anyway. But with your time on Drag Race, though, I feel like you, you did have a really good run on the show. I had uh, Lux on the show recently, and with her, I feel like you had a very similar run to her in that, like, you did very well in the competition. You really didn't have, like, any hiccups. And she said that when she was on the show it was really frustrating because she felt like she did everything correctly and like still like it wasn't enough is that kind of like an experience that you would echo for yourself on the show as well no i gagged myself oh, i you did better than you thought you would i thought that my goal was to make it to the top four i would have loved to have won but i didn't really know what that and i didn't i didn't really see that for myself mm -hmm. at that point because i was like i don't know if i even know that much about my and i didn't mm -hmm. um about myself to to really hone a crown like that but but I did see myself going to the top four. But but in my season, it was different because they they shook us right off the bat, and I was a failure in the first episode. That fucking gagged me. But therefore, I had this like I had something to prove, and I was therefore like inevitably going to be an underdog. And mm. um and so no, I like every time that I like excelled in something in the in the show, which was often like tea. I like just saying it is it, what it, it is. It was, yeah. you know, um, I'm good at a lot of shit, mm -hmm. but it, 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 it was, um, I don't know. It, it, it felt really good for me. I, I never felt like I was, I was, there was like nothing, something I, 
You know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. there wasn't like a layer that I couldn't peel down. I definitely went in. I was also very fearful and had like a skewed perception suddenly of like what winning could even be because I looked so much up to Britta and Jan as my drag sisters, like older than drag, Jan is younger than me, but like in drag, they were just mm -hmm. more prevalent than I was in their careers when they went to Drag Race. And it didn't turn out the way that they expected it to. And yeah. I was gagged. Cause I thought, I fully thought that the, on season 12, like Jam would be like in the top four. And I thought the Brita Filter was gonna win Drag Race. Yeah. And like, it, so I was really, really scared mm -hmm. of what, you know, I didn't know how I would stand. Cause mm -hmm. I I felt weaker than them, like like going into the competition. Yeah. I mean, to be fair, like maybe that self-deprecation, self-deprecation thing is like real. Like, I well, I think it's a little. Maybe I like just don't believe in myself. A little self-deprecation, but I also think like no shame, but a little bit of realism because, as you said, like you went on Drag Race, you had only been doing drag for a couple of years. Like you were like what two years? Three years. And so you're going on Drag Race against people like Tina Burner, who, you know, despite her appearance, is a big name in New York, and you know, <laughs> and Jan just came on the show, so yeah, I mean, I, I just didn't have the mindset of like, I'm just happy to be here, I'll, maybe I'll gag myself, and. Well, I did gag myself when I, when I lost that first lip sync. I, I did not expect, I had, more, I had more confidence than to think I would like go home on the first episode. That fucking yeah. shook me. But for all the Drag Race fans, can you answer the question, uh, is it true that you and Denali are like boyfriends and in love and kiss and stuff? <laughs> no, of course no? not. No, of course not. And what was all that for? That was for, uh, well, you know what? What we, was it for? What was the we reason? Were, when we were there, we, we were playing into a narrative that was given to us. And also, like, mm. full T, like, I think, and now, like, like you know, years later, Denali and I are still very, we're very close friends. I, it shocks me how, like, we went to, like, we, we when we're in the same, like, when we're doing the same gig, it, it could be a lot of girls. We find each other and we just start hanging out. It, it means a lot to me. Like, it, it happened at DragCon. And I was like, girl, we could be hanging out with so many bitches and we just want to like kiki with each other. Mm -hmm. That is so cute. Mm -hmm. um, but it's for the, the storyline. It's just continuity well, for the we, fans. But we, kinda, we also kind of like, you know, like Denali's like so my type. So mm -hmm. like I think back then too, it was kind of like, you know, I did think that, that she was cute. Like, mm -hmm. you know, but yeah, it wasn't real. Mm -hmm. We were both in relationships. You guys have, have like a pact. Like if you're both single by the time you're 40. No. Then, no? No. <laughs> okay. No. She's like, no. you, gotta, you gotta feed the audience something. They just want, you know, Rose Nolly is still- If they still... book us both for All Stars in the same season, they will be so fed uh -huh. by that storyline. We would go so far. Girl, we'd fuck on camera. Mm -hmm. You're like, it's for storyline. Yes. Uh, <laughs> the safe word is cut. <laughs> I would love if All Stars called us at the same time. That would be such a gag. Mm -hmm. I'm, just, I'm, just trying, I'm just trying to help you know, set things up for give people what they want. That's what the show is all about. We're about giving people what they want. Okay. Most of the time. Loves that. But with that, that's the uh, end of my cards and the last bit of time we have before we have to get you back to Drag Race Live. But yeah. before you go, I did want to give you something. Uh, as you mentioned earlier, obviously a huge musical fan. Your favorite musical is Hair. Mm -hmm. So I got you a 1968 copy, vinyl copy of Hair Maddie, on vinyl. That is so nice. Mm -hmm. uh, but I just saying, what, what was it about Hair specifically? Because I think when a lot of people imagine a drag queen that's in theater, they think their favorite play is going to be like pageant or you know some big Liza Minnelli. Why hair specifically? Girl, that's my life. Fuck that shit. Um, this is so nice. Thank you so much. Yeah, that's really nice. Mm -hmm. Um, the music and the story. The, the just the I I'm obsessed with the the '60s, mm -hmm. the hippie movement. Just the the feeling of freedom associated with this piece of art is like so. I also just like it, it's less it's less of a gag now, but like the fact that like iconically at the end of Act One they all like fucking you know are butt ass naked. Mm. It's just there's something there's something about this piece of theater, in again w with the music as well being so incredible, uh, so incredible, so fun to sing. Mm. That just I don't know has always been very freeing for me as an audience member, um, and as a theater lover. But I've never done that. I almost did the show once in college, but I didn't do it. So other than your upcoming role as a burger and hair, like what, what do you have coming out? Like what, what projects do you have in the works right now? What can we expect from you in the near future and in the, the slightly further away future? Well, I'm always working on new music. I actually, um, I was like- Oh, you're solo. I was like teasing it last night on Instagram as if it's coming out, which is because I was fucking bored, which is mm -hmm. hysterical. But I actually finished my first, my debut album oh. um, last year. Um, and then there were complications with it dropping. And so I decided to 
hold on to it for a bit longer, maybe mm-hmm. edit it a little bit, maybe add some more stuff. But there is music coming. Mm-hmm. Do, you have, I, do you have visuals or are you still Photoshopping right now? <laughs> Both. Actually, um, there is there is going to be, we've we've filmed like 90% of it, but we did a, a music video to my last um my last single, a cover of I Drove All Night. Um I feel I feel like I'd be doing the audience a disservice if I didn't ask about that album cover of like you behind the wheel of the car with how space tuned <laughs> that photo is. It's not what, fa- it's, what, what is we, the story behind that? I would love to tell it. It's not a photo at all. It's literally an artist rendering of me. It is based on It's an artist rendering. Yeah, it, and it's okay. not AI. It's um it's but it's 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 produced to look like AI and it was it's definitely a an extremely femme depiction of me but it was yeah. just i don't know I, I liked it i thought it was like a fantasy um i'm also so fucking delusional mm-hmm. and i mean it looked like blair st Clair cosplaying as rose i know i know but it, you know it was it, mm-hmm. it, it it made people listen to the music more because they were talking about oh you know story, everyone's so. like i was like i was like what's going on with like what's i feel like there's a story here it felt almost like it was like intentional no marketing. it's just yeah another one of rose's delusional moments uh you know but for the people like watching it was not an actual photo of no you. it's not a, it's not a photo at all it's someone drew it mm. I did approve it and say, yeah, that looks like me. Yeah, you're like, that's me. But, you know. The, the one moment you don't self-deprecate, you're like, you know what? That is what I look like. <laughs> and everyone. Because well, it's cut. I thought it looked great. Yeah. Um, well, but did. so the, we have a music video coming out uh, pretty soon for that. We're, I'm actually rapping, shooting that. We're doing one more scene next week. And then speaking of covers, I'm, I'm working now. Uh, my day job while I'm in Vegas, I've been arranging and writing uh, a solo show that is just me at the mic. Oh, just me really singing is. my favorite songs, you know. Yeah, it's, you're having your like your Susan Boyle moment. You're having an orchestra behind you. I'm not having my Susan Boyle moment. No. When I was a child, Mm-mm. no, no, no. <laughs> it's a rose moment. <laughs> so yeah, that, uh, are your are your socials are they the same? No, you have you have different. No, everything's social. the same. Everything's oh, the same. Now? You can find me at Oh My God Hey Rose, O M G Hey Rose. That's my socials. So people can find you there. And you guys can find me right here on YouTube. Make sure to like, comment, and subscribe so you don't miss a single episode. And join us next time whenever we have somebody else. <laughs> you never know who it's going to be. And yeah. You didn't even know if I was going to show up today. No, I didn't. But that's a whole other story for you know a, a different moment. I'm Maybe here. a deleted scene. We'll talk about it. But yeah. Till then. <laughs> Bye, guys. Bye. Let's go. Work. You're not like other drag queens. I'm not like other. I'm not like other girls.